study I wrote some years ago, and it concerns finding your way to the feet of Jesus using the spiritual disciplines as a pathway to his presence. And we've talked about several of those over the past several weeks. And today, I want to talk with you about confession and journaling. Now, these are ideas that you may not be very familiar with, and you may say, how are they even spiritual disciplines? Well, follow along and I think you'll understand better as we go. What is the truth about your spiritual life? I'm talking to you personally. I want you to think about your own heart, your own life. Would you be willing to sit down and tell me or tell someone else about the man or woman that you are? Honestly, most of us are unwilling to be that vulnerable with others and our greatest fear is that people will discover who we are not. And that is a valid fear. For there are some who are self-appointed accusers and slanderers who would like nothing better than to destroy us. However, there are others that God places in our lives to be trusted brothers and sisters with whom we can share the deepest recesses of our souls. Now, we've been talking about soul rest, and as you know, I've told you that soul rest is for the weary and heavy laden. The weariest people I know are those who are walking in the shadow of unconfessed sin. I think I've already told you uh, through this study that one of the best little books that I have ever read was by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and it was called Life Together. And in that book, Dietrich Bonhoeffer makes this statement. He says, he who is alone with his sin is utterly alone. And he points out the sinister nature of unconfessed sin. He says, sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive the power of sin over him and the more deeply he becomes involved with it, and the more disastrous is his isolation. But in confession, the light of the gospel breaks into the darkness and seclusion of his heart. The sin simply must be brought into the light. As Baptists, we have stressed the importance of confessing our sin to Christ alone in order to find forgiveness. That doctrinal truth must never be abandoned. However, we have to admit that we've abandoned the clear teaching of Scripture to confess our sins to one another. James 5, 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Bringing our sin into the light of day exposes it as an affront to God. We know that our sin is offensive to our brother. However, it is easier to be an offense to God who we can't see than to our brother who we can see. Confession brings sin into the light of day so that it can be judged for what it is and so that we can experience God's forgiveness in the presence of a brother or sister in Christ. Usually, our aversion to confession is related to our own personal pride. We fear that somebody might see us for who we are. We also fear being seen for who we are not. That is especially true in the lives of spiritual leaders. Confession cuts us down to size, and, it, and proves us to be, in the presence of another, the spiritual pygmies we know ourselves to be. 
So as we're talking about confession, you might think, uh, how in the world would I do that? How would, how would I approach that as a spiritual discipline? Well, confession is simply being honest before a brother or sister so that we know ourselves to be honest before God. Now, let me tell you, confession, like fasting, is a call from God. It is not to be entered into lightly or carelessly, but cautiously and prayerfully and with a deep desire for spiritual healing and deliverance. In his book, On Beginning from Within, Douglas Steer calls confession an examination of the conscience by which the soul comes under the gaze of God, the sinner suddenly exposed to God's silent and loving presence is pierced to the quick and becomes conscious of things that must be forgiven and put right with God. Under the gaze of God, we have no choice but to confess our sins. When God identifies the presence of sin in your life, what you do next determines whether you can continue to have fellowship with God. So when God reveals sin, what should you do? Well, you should be honest about it. You should be honest about it with God, and you should be honest about it with your brother. What does it mean to confess? Well, of the times that you read it in the Bible, what does it mean? Well, it means the same thing it means every day. It means to admit to. It means to own. It means to publicly say so. Henry Cloud and John Townsend are Christian psychologists, and in their book, How People Grow, they reveal that confession involves taking a risk with a negative part of ourselves by letting someone else know about it. Out of that self-revelation, we experience comfort, identification, and truth without judgment, and the soul begins to heal. Let me give you a good illustration of what I mean by confession and what that looks like when it's practiced in the right way. The late Duncan Campbell was used of God as his instrument in revival on the Isle of Lewis in 1949. Because God used him mightily, people were drawn to him for spiritual guidance. On one occasion, after preaching a sermon, he was approached by a young man who was under tremendous conviction. He was suffering from guilt over a sin he committed. He, he had confessed it to God, asking for his forgiveness, but he failed to find peace in his heart that the sin was forgiven. In, in the words of Duncan Campbell, Duncan Campbell said he had wronged a maid in his father's house. The girl was pregnant. He denied that he was the father of the child and he left the girl in disgrace. That was his sin. The young man had been told that all he had to do was to confess his sin to God uh, and leave it with him because someone said, Calvary covers it all. Duncan Campbell said, someone has led you astray, young man. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Calvary will not cover what you will not uncover. The young man begged Duncan Campbell to tell him what he needed to do to have peace, Duncan Campbell replied. You go right now and you write three letters. You sit down and write one to the girl, acknowledging that you're the father. Next, you sit down and write one to her parents, telling them the truth. Finally, you write a letter to your own father, telling him the whole story. Tell it all. The next morning, Duncan Campbell was privileged to read all three of those letters before they were mailed. The first time I heard Duncan Campbell tell that story, the Holy Spirit spoke the same words to my heart, and he should be speaking these words to you right now. Calvary will not cover what you will not uncover. So I'm asking you tonight, do you have hidden sin in your life? Hidden sin, unconfessed sin, makes us a liar before men and a liar before God. Why? Well, because we have put ourselves forward as a person who is not a sinner in the eyes of men and not a sinner in the eyes of God. 
In so doing, uh, we put forth a life that is a lie. We present a lie from the pulpit. We present a lie from the pew. We present a lie from the choir. Remember, if we say, according to John, 1 John 1, 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. So it's important that we confess our sins, that we confess our sins to God. And on occasion, when called by God to do so, that we confess our sins in the presence of a trusted brother or sister in, in the Christian life. Now, this is one of the most difficult disciplines in the Christian life. However, it's also one of the most blessed. Through confession, in the presence of a fellow believer, we come to the feet of Jesus for soul rest. The sin then concealed that separated us from the fellowship is now gone, and we're walking in fellowship with our brothers and sisters of Christ in transparent openness before them. Now, it's important to understand that, that you only have to confess your sin to one individual, not the whole congregation. God, I don't believe, wants us to do that. He wants us to find someone we can trust, and he will lead us to that person, someone with whom we can bear our souls, someone who will pray for us and walk with us. You've heard of someone call it an accountability partner. Well, that's what it is. Somebody who can hold you accountable before God to be what you ought to be and to do what you ought to do. That's what confession is. So somewhat akin to confession, that's what we've been talking about. Now we want to move to journaling because it's like confession in a different sort of way. Journaling is not a discipline mentioned in Scripture. However, David appears to have kept a journal of his own walk with God. The Psalms, uh, the whole book of Psalms seems to be the, the, a record of David's spiritual journey of his heart cries to God. Even uh, the book of Jeremiah is a book that God told Jeremiah to write. And in the book of Jeremiah, we find some of his own praying, some of his own uh, heart cries to God. Luke's account in the book of Acts appears to come from notes that he took during his investigation of the lives of the apostles and his journeys with Paul. And even Paul's own epistles give us a written record of his own heart, his prayers, his personal struggles, and some powerful statements of his own faith in God. I began keeping a journal in 1986 after reading a book called Ordering Your Private World by Gordon MacDonald. Uh, I have not been faithful to visit my journal on a daily basis. Sometimes months pass with my journal abandoned, and usually those are dark moments in my own walk with God. My journals across the years record my own heart cries to God for personal and family needs, as well as my own personal struggles in the Christian life. Usually my journal entry takes up no more than one page, uh, and now they chronicle almost 25 years of my own walk with God. One day, uh, those journals will fall into the hands of, of my children and grandchildren. And I said 25 years, it's almost 35 now. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and I hope when they find those journals, they will find them dotted with prayers I prayed for them and for their families, for their faith and their future. I also hope that in my journals, they will find a man who aimed for God's heart, although often I missed. A journal can be used to record verses that God used to speak to your heart, and you might wish to jot down insights God gave you in moments of scripture reading and meditation. For years, I just used little composition books, and uh, I, I just made a record of of my, of my journey with God, I would date it at the top and I would initial it at the bottom uh, that I had written those thoughts or those prayers or whatever they were. My wife knows of the existence of my journals, though to my knowledge, she's never read a page out of one. A couple of years ago, she bought me a nice leather bound journal. Even the smell of the leather has become for me an aroma that makes me anticipate pouring out my heart to God on its pages. 
Now, how you use your journal will determine whether you want anyone to see it or not. Uh, you might want to be confessional in your journal, using, as a, using it as a place to hold your own heart accountable before God. A journal that records your private struggles needs to be kept from public view. You wouldn't want yourself to be misunderstood. Samuel Rima and Gary McIntosh, in their book, Overcoming the Dark Side of Leadership, warn of the flip side of using a journal to promote a false image of who we are, saying that there will be a constant temptation to paint ourselves in a better light. Uh, the urge will be strong to leave out some of the uglier and more negative behaviors and actions in our lives. And when we, we, when we succumb to those urges, we're being swept away by the current of self-denial and deceit. The act of journaling will not be helpful if you're not honest before God in that journal. Some believe the journal should be uh, more confessional in nature and for that reason ought to be kept private. Robert Mulholland offers the following advice for keeping a confessional journal. He says, as you use your journal, take particular note of your feelings, attitudes, actions, and responses to the word Analyze your attempts to carry it into your daily life and the disciplines the Word has brought into your being. Note your victories and your failures, your elation and your despair, your frustration and your fulfillment. Be brutally open and honest with yourself regarding your encounter with God and your response to His Word and keep it private. This will help you uh, be more constructive in your journal the only person uh, who you would ever want to see your journal, he says, is someone you might choose to reveal its contact, some, uh, contact, somebody who perhaps is a spiritual mentor in your life. On the other hand, there are those who encourage that spiritual journal to be kept with future readers in mind, and that's the way I write. I hope that one day somebody's going to flip through the pages, perhaps one of my children or grandchildren, and... Uh, Look at my journey. And Donald Whitney, who wrote a book called Simplify Your Spiritual Life, said this. He said, despite the length of your life, all your hard work, all you've accumulated, and all you've done for and with your children and grandchildren, it's unlikely that anyone will know anything about you in less than a thousand months from now, except for what you write. Journaling gives us a record of our spiritual questions, struggles, and insights across extended seasons of our lives. By reviewing the journal, we're able to recognize sinful patterns, seasons of growth, trials overcome, and the guiding hand of God upon our lives. You might choose to keep a journal of your time for a week. In doing so, you see what happened across those days, and you might find some patterns uh, that, that you were more tempted to sin when you were tired or, or certain things that, that, that brought struggles in your spiritual life. And using a journal uh, can, can be helpful in that way. And, and there are times you'll find that even a walk or a nap uh, become spiritual lifesavers that can lead to soul rest. You'll have a record of what's going on in your spiritual life. When I come to my journal, I come to the feet of Jesus. In that journal, I give him my problems and my burdens and my sin. With pencil in hand, I seem to see him more clearly for who he is. I'm able to open my heart and share my heart with the Lord on paper and present myself to God without fear uh, of any present or future reader uh, seeing my journal. And as you use your journal, you might want to use symbols little symbols that you alone know what those symbols mean. And those symbols may record some failure, some spiritual failure, some spiritual struggle that you're having. And you can go back and see when you were victorious or, or when you failed. And that way, nobody else knows what those are but you. But at least you know your journey as you make a record and you keep a record of your own walk with God. So I'm just talking to you tonight about these two spiritual disciplines. Confession on the one hand, walking in transparent openness before a trusted brother or a sister, 
and journaling, being transparently open before God, writing it down, keeping a record of what God says to you, what you're saying to God, and what's happening in your life along the way. These are spiritual disciplines meant to bring us to the feet of Jesus for soul rest. Through confession, we meet uh, Christ in the embrace and forgiveness of a Christian brother or sister. Through journaling, we meet him in the quiet of our own closet where we bear our hearts before his probing gaze. The Lord will be the one who will lead you to one of these disciplines, or perhaps both of them. All of them that we've talked about so far, scripture reading and meditation, prayer and fasting, solitude and silence, and now confession and journaling are simply disciplines that help you come to the feet of Jesus to find what you so desperately need. What you need is to be in His presence. For in His presence, you have everything that you need. And in His presence, you will find soul rest. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.